the answer? Or... Yeah, I feel that's good. And we're live. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first national virtual town hall for the Brock Pierce and Carla Ballard campaign. So happy to have you with us today and thank you for joining us virtually from all over the country. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our presidential and vice presidential candidates, Brock Pierce and Carla Ballard. Carla and Brock have been working incredibly hard to gather all of you from around the nation to make sure that every voice is heard. One of the most important parts of this campaign is that we bring people together and make sure that we're addressing issues that traditional party politics is not paying attention to. So we're really excited to have you with us here today to introduce you to our candidates, our movement, our campaign, and some of the policy issues that are the underpinnings of everything that we stand for. So firstly, please meet Rob Pierce and Carla Ballard. My name is Mr. Geiser, our campaign manager, and I will be moderating today, asking Rob and Carla important questions about what motivated them to get involved in politics, what we're doing in this movement, and what are the opportunities for people to get involved and get their voice heard by our campaign in this election cycle. So thank you, Brock and Carla, for being here with everyone today. Really excited to have you here. So first of all, I would love for each of you to take a moment to tell our audience a little bit more about yourself. I'm sure a lot of people have heard a bit about your background and why you're here. But what I really want to know is what has inspired you in your life to get involved in public service? Yeah, I guess I'll, uh, I'll start and I will uh, skip over most of my background. Um, I would hope by now everyone has learned at least a little bit about me, but if you haven't, I will uh, at least give you a bit of a brief, brief background. I'm, we're right now in Minnesota, uh, the state where I was made uh, and grew up. Uh, I started uh, uh, life as an actor. I eventually made a, a movie here in Minnesota known as Mighty Ducks, you know, that flying D, triple D. I played young Emilio Estevez or young Gordon Bombay that missed the shot, the premise of the movie. That brought me to California, where I eventually starred in some films, most notably one called First Kid, where I played the son of the president of the United States of America, uh, was in that as my Secret Service agent. And at the age of 16, I decided that I wanted to be an internet entrepreneur, not knowing how. This was 1997. I built a number of businesses in digital media, virtual currencies and, and things within virtual worlds. Eventually that led me to uh, uh, blockchain and digital currency and taking these concepts to the real world. I've done a lot of stuff there and so I'm not going to bore you. Um, and, and there's lots of things you can look up. But uh, I'm 39 today, I turned 40 in November. Why am I running for the office of president of the United States of America? It's a big thing to do. And it's not something that you do lightly. It is a very, very serious mission. I'm a father of two young girls. And when I look around at the world around me and the state of things, I am deeply, deeply concerned about theirs and our collective future. I made a commitment to live my life in service and to measure my success in life by the positive impact I have. And I've seen and I've discussed at some of the highest levels of government, specifically our government, and what I saw through that exploration and that core sample is that there is not really one, there isn't really anyone there paying attention to the gauges, though we seem to be accelerating uh, uh, pedal to the metal and no one has their hands on the wheel. And when I saw that, I became even more alarmed and realized that if it's not us, who? And that as many of us that feel like they are prepared to commit to civil service and doing what they can, if enough of us step up and rise to the occasion, we might be able to avert 
a potential future disaster. And this is not about me. This is about all of us. And I encourage and invite every one of you, because most of us have never thought about public office or being civil servants. And one of the most amazing things that's happened with me over these last, you know, call it six weeks, as I've been, you know, in back-to-back -back meetings and phone calls with entrepreneurs, artists, people from every walk of life, is people are saying, Brock, thank you for giving me permission. Thank you for showing me that I could do this. Maybe I should run, run for city council. Uh, maybe I could be a mayor. Maybe I could be a governor, a state senator, a congressperson. I wanna remind everyone that yes, you can. And if, you, if this message resonates with you and it calls to you, you know, maybe this election, it's a little late, but there's the midterms in 2022, another election in 2024. I just wanna plant that seed because uh, it's gonna take all of us. And so that's why I'm running. Thank you so much, Brock. That was incredibly inspiring. I just wanna let everyone in the audience know that some of the issues that you just addressed, we're really excited for you to engage with us on. So if you check out polls at the bottom of your screen, I'm about to ask you a question, which is, have you ever considered running for public office? So we'd love to hear from you on that one if you have time to answer that. And now I'd like to hear from Carla. Tell us about when Brock asked you to join him as vice president. What were the first thoughts that went through your mind and had you ever thought of doing this before? Mm. So my name is Carla Ballard and it is such an honor to be able to connect with all of you that are tuning in. I'm born and raised where our constitution was created and drafted and uh, that would be Philadelphia. I um, am thrilled to be here in the state of Minnesota with my running mate and uh, soon to be president of the United States because <laughs> we're just claiming it. Um, you know, it's been, it, it's been an incredible journey. You know, I'm an entrepreneur like Brock and one of the things that made me say yes is that we are facing right now a real divide in our country. Um, you know, what Brock and I decided to do was to say that we would never talk negative about any other candidate that we may be running against and instead to focus on solutions. So why I said yes was because of the fact that I feel like we need to model we need to model what a campaign really, what we believe should be about, which is to focus literally on what are the things and strategies we need to deploy to address the major issues that you all are facing, that we're facing right now. Not tomorrow, not the next day, not five years from now, but right now. So what we look at, what we're looking at doing is igniting Gen Z, igniting millennials, igniting individuals who are just frustrated with the two-party system to come before you and say, there is room, there is opportunity for a third party. And we are that. And so I said, yes, standing on those principles and standing on that sense of need for innovation. Absolutely. I think it's so important this time around to help cure political apathy. There are so many people that even if they've voted before, they might not even know how to vote this time around during a time of COVID. They've never worked an absentee ballot. And of course, we have an entire generation of young people that are first time voters. So we're here to motivate people to get excited about politics again. And I think that's one of the most important things that both of you guys are bringing as candidates. So I, I'd really love to talk to you guys about the fact that you've launched an independent campaign. When our system is designed to create obstacles for third parties, it's a very important journey to decide to embark on this. So tell us why you believe time for voices to be heard that have traditionally not really been addressed by the two party system. Um, we're having some technical difficulties here. Uh, I don't know if this is a bandwidth issue on your end or our end, but um, I think I understood the question. 
which is uh, uh, our view on uh, third party candidates. Uh, and since some we, of the obstacles. And some of the obstacles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're running as, um, uh, as independents. And so I'll just take you back in time through a little bit of history. Our, um, our founding fathers, George Washington in particular, at his closing address, George Washington was not, didn't believe in political parties, and so he did not belong to a political party. And at his closing address, he warned us about the threat of political parties and that they were dangerous. And John Adams and a number of other founding fathers uh, made similar statements, and their worst fear might have been that uh, we had two dominant political parties but immediately following that, the Federalists emerged. And then after the Federalists, we ended up with one political party, one dominant political party known as the Democratic Republican Party. And in 1824, there was four candidates all running from that same political party. After that election, the political party split into two, the Democrats and the Republicans, though the Republicans uh, uh, were being thwarted temporarily by the Whigs. And then the Republicans found dominance over the Whig Party about 25 or so years later. And we've had those two political parties that have dominated our political system exactly as we were warned as Americans to never permit. So I feel very strongly about the role of a third party. If you study evolutionary systems, if you study any system where you have two, just two choices, right? Two, two things where you have a binary environment. What happens in binary environments is either those two systems come together magnetically and become absolute sort of collusion, right? Or they magnetically become polarized and they move in the reverse direction and become totally divided. This is why we need a trinity of systems and why I think it's so important as Americans, that we rise above the existing partisan two-party system to create a third choice, one where for me to win, you have to lose the ending of that paradigm. And instead, when we win, uh -oh. um, anyway, I was saying the uh, that binary outcome of that two-party system is one where for me to win, you have to lose. And so we have this environment where we keep winning or losing, winning or losing. We eventually have to transcend that into an environment where we all win. And I think that moment will be when those of us that have risen above the division in this country have chosen to unite and in that unity we have become a majority and created a trinity of choices which will hopefully lead to more choices and more choices you know thomas jefferson told us that we need some type of revolution every 20 years even things like our constitution we're not supposed to become entirely static systems right we're supposed to be continually evolving as we have new information. And if we didn't have those little revolutions, you know, things would eventually end poorly. It's been basically 200 years since we've had one and revolutions come in two forms. The lowercase r, which I call the evolutionary events, which are the ones we want. These are the healthy sort of like ways of, uh, of driving progress and change. And then you get the capital R revolutions. Those often end violently and are very unpleasant. And so I pray for this country to find a path that is not left or right, but a path forward in unity together. And that is why I am committed to supporting the independent or independence movement in whatever name each state chooses to call it. I choose to speak positively because I think we need a different kind of leadership, not one where in our primaries we're throwing 
mud or stones or food at each other and constantly criticizing, you know, it's how well can I put you down, but instead talk about vision, hopefully say inspiring things, teach us something that might serve us in the future, and more than anything, to identify problems, but to focus that conversation on solutions. This is what real leadership is, which is also known as stewardship or custodianship. And I feel this is something we generally lack. And I'm convinced that together we can change it. And just to follow up, Brittany, I'm so glad that you asked that question. There are obstacles, of course, to an independent party being able to get on the ballot. Uh, you know, Brock and I have run into some very insightful learnings. Uh, however, we both see them as opportunities, right? And, you know, I think at this day and age, when people are losing people to COVID-19, when people have lost their jobs, the last thing that people want to talk about is negative bantering back and forth. I think people want to know right now what solutions are there to address the issues. So when having independent party as part of this electoral process, it gives people something to tune into that is not just about negativity, as Brock said, but it's about inspiring the next generation and all of us to think about what could our electoral process look like if we came together, whether you're on the right, whether you're on the left, whether you're in the middle, you have a seat at our table. And we are thrilled to allow your thoughts, your voices, your idea to be heard. We are not going to be judgmental. We are going to be open-minded. And that's something brand spanking new for our system. And I, I'll add to that that we will not speak negatively of any people individuals or even organizations and forgive us if we do <laughs> we're not perfect but that is our intention this is the place from which we operate but we will point out problems and identify issues and i will say having a front row seat to this process the system is rigged the system is rigged to prevent independent candidates mm -hmm from participating in this process. You know, again, a concern our founding fathers had, and it played out exactly as they feared. Um, for example, in, uh, for example, in the state of New York, you needed 15,000 signatures petitions to get on the ballot in the state of New York, which is a very big number. And in the heart of COVID, in April, when New York was getting hit as hard as anywhere in the world, you would think to support our democratic process that you would say, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna permit electronic signatures because you can't have people going door to door. Or you'd think, that you'd say, let's lower the number from 15,000, maybe to 1,500, right? To, to, to again, respect our democratic process. So, you know, at a minimum, if nothing else, that you would respect the status quo. Right. In New York, they increased the number in April from 15,000 to 45,000 to take it from basically impossible to even more impo impossible cubed. And, you know, as, as someone sitting in the middle of this, and this is barely reported on, um, it, it's a wild thing. And now as I've gone around the country and dealing with, you know, people that specialize in this, I mean, I was being told by one of the founders of the Independence Party in one of the major states that has ran for Senate and Congress and, you know, gotten governors elected. He was explaining that, in, in, in some places, it, it may have been over a hundred years since an independent candidate was able to get on the ballot through direct signatures and petitions, because he was so impressed that we're actually pulling this off right. in COVID. Uh, he's just like, whoa, this is amazing. I'm so excited. I love the, the determination of this crew. <laughs> um, love, love, love what you do and how you do.
And so um, it's it's just been an amazing thing um, in, uh, in 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 Los Angeles uh, uh, due to COVID, uh, and which we clearly yeah, respect. Absolutely, we respect uh, our masks are on. Right. We're only taking them off here. Yep. We've been together plenty. Yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we are comfortable yeah, with the true. risk of sitting together, yeah. but we are, um, you know, we understand how uh, how difficult this has been and yeah. it's affected friends, loved ones, yeah. family in some instances. Um, and so this is not um, uh, uh, to criticize anyone specifically for making the best decisions you can, but in um, when they have these sort of COVID shutdowns, um, you know, there's various degrees of shutdown, but there is always what is considered to be you know, essential work right. or essential industry, things that make sure that, you know, the system keeps running. Right. And in Los Angeles, they've decided that president, the presidential election, uh, that our democratic process is not considered um, essential. And so uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not gonna be spending uh, much time in, in Southern California because it does not think it, mm -hmm. democracy is uh, essential <laughs> to our collective future. And so uh, I could go on and go through more and more examples of this. Um, but the good news is we're going to tell you all about it. Right. Not only are you going to know everything by the time this is done, we're going to show you how it works so that if you want to do the same thing, you know, we're going to teach you. Like this is kind of yeah. this opaque system. I'm a big believer in truth and transparency. And so I'm going to show you from the, you know, from the inside, you know, from within the heart of the beast, how it works so that we can... Uh, potentially make a change. You know, I think back in high school when we had, or even elementary school, when we had Civics 101 or social studies, we got to learn about our process um, in terms of how our democratic system was supposed to work. And I think a lot of individuals now are a little dismayed, right? Not apathetic, but dismayed about how OPEC to Brock's point this actually works. And so at this stage, what you guys get to do is journey with us through the process in real time. We'll actually be releasing content that will focus on behind the scenes look into our electoral process in terms of campaigning, what it takes to get on the ballot, uh, things that are important so that you too can be empowered to, like Brock said earlier, potentially run for office. So that's another uh, aspect of our campaign that I think is really different. Well, I think it's worth uh, double clicking on one of those now, because I think it's very relevant to anyone watching. Why paying attention to us right now matters, right? There's the, in the long term, yes, but in the short term, you know, why right now? This is relevant to what happens in the next three months. Because a lot of people would say, you know, a vote for you guys would be a waste, you know, a waste of a vote or a vote for this or that, or, you know, what's the point? Why should I focus? Why should I contribute? You know, whether it be my time, my resources, whatever, uh, my connections. And so, because they're like, it's so late, you have no chance of winning. And so let me break down a little bit of how the system works because I've been meeting with a lot of the top political experts and posters and, 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 and everybody you would expect. And, you know, they asked me the same question. They're like, why are you doing this? Okay. There's a why. Right. Uh, and, and what do you expect to accomplish? Yeah. I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a game sort of system designer. Right. And so I, I, I study systems and I study them historically in a way that is different than most people, which is why I've normally been five or 10 years, uh, uh, ahead of where the world is going and, and, and running far ahead of the pack in some instances, not always successfully. Uh, and, and, and sometimes with, uh, <laughs> scars, but, um, uh, uh, always fun. Um, and so, uh, well, and also things come out of it. Yeah. Things come out of it. Yeah. Cause it's not about my individual success. It's very important that we have people that are paving the way, right? A lot of it, there's this concept of the second mouse gets the cheese. You know, the first one goes in to grab it Sorry. and, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm happy to be the first mouse. <laughs> I'm happy to take a little bit of risk for those that follow. Right. 
um, uh, 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 you know, I'm, I'm the, they don't make traps that work on me, so I'm not worried about that. <laughs> anyway, um, and so, uh, uh, but to get to the point, um, I explain to these individuals that you know that you don't have to win the election to become president. And everyone's like, huh? What, what do you mean? Because this is like, this is a pretty foreign idea, but it's something that tends to surprise people. You don't have to win the election to become president. They're like, well, what does that, does that have something to do with the electoral college vote? I go, yes, it does. So the way our, our election works is in our general election, a candidate needs to receive a majority of the electoral college vote to win. The key word being majority. So in the country, we have 538 electoral college votes. A majority is 270 or more. So what happens in a two party system if there's a tie? That's 269 to 269. Season five of Veep. Um, or the year 1800, 1800, Thomas Jefferson versus Aaron Burr. Okay, uh, so he's pointing at me because I am the fifth generation great granddaughter of Aaron Burr. Yes. For context. Um, and so, yes, and so that happened in the year 1800. Another example is what would happen if a third party candidate, right, were to win a single state? All of a sudden, it gets harder to get to a majority. What if a third party were to win three states? It becomes likely that no one will win the election. This is what happened in the year 1824. Four candidates succeeded in achieving electoral college votes. And so then all of a sudden, the people I'm talking to are like, they're really leaning in at this point. They're like, so, so what happens? What happens if no one wins? I'm like, well, they take the top three candidates and then those candidates are handed to the House of Representatives. And the House chooses the president. And they're like, but it's a Democratic House. I go, well, the 12th Amendment doesn't work exactly like that. In this scenario, each state gets one vote. So there's 50 votes. The electors in each state get to vote. And it's whoever can get 26 states to agree. Meaning, if we win three states, or we win two states and Kanye wins one state, or if we win one state, Kanye wins one state, and Rocky uh, wins even one district, and like Maine, for example, all of a sudden, we, 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 we get ourselves a record-setting disruptive event that hasn't happened since 1824, and um, this is why you should pay attention. We truly have the potential to disrupt the political system this year, right now, this late in the game. And that's why I encourage you to get involved and if nothing else, at least understand what we're up to uh, and vote, vote whoever you vote for because that civic responsibility, that civic duty is so important to our collective future. Remember the future will happen to you or with you. Yeah. I recommend having a say in it. Thank you so much for talking more about the issues that are specifically presented to independent and third party voices. You guys have heard about these obstacles and I think you understand what we're up against over the next couple months and how much we're excited to engage with you, especially on issues that are not normally addressed by the two major parties. So you can check out another poll that I have at the bottom of the screen for you, which is are you interested in an independent platform that you might have not seen addressed by Republicans and Democrats? I can see that most of you are excited about hearing more from third parties, which is really great for us to hear. If you're a staunch Democrat or Republican, tell us that too. That's okay. We're open to everyone contributing to what we're doing here. So we've heard a little bit more about how important it is to get away from partisan politics, right? I think everyone remembers in 2004 when Barack Obama said, we are not the red states and the blue states. We are the United States of America. And we truly seek to be addressing issues that we believe all Americans can get behind and agree upon in order to move our country forward. So Brock and Carla, 
in so many ways, you guys have led lives of service. You've built important businesses and companies. You've been driving innovation in your career. You've led the way in social impact projects, community organizing, and philanthropy. So throughout your life and your experience, what are some of these issues that you've seen affecting our nation that you're going to be concentrating on in this campaign? Well, I'll, I'll touch on a couple of them that are important to me. Number one is the debt. The United States has a debt problem, whether it be at our national debt, whether it be our addiction to corporate debt, or even our problem at, with consumer debt and buying things we don't need and not having savings. This is a very real issue. And combined with that is the US dollar and the strength and the long-term resiliency of the dollar. These things are all connected. And so this is, a, this is a thing that I look forward to engaging through our collaborative platform in a discussion, because I think it's a big one. The other one that I haven't covered is poverty and the great wealth divide. Right now, the difference between the haves and the have nots is getting greater and greater. And the tension from it is becoming greater and greater. Now you add COVID and unemployment occurring as a result of that, and then take the way that technology is changing the landscape of work, the way that it's affecting everyone from service jobs to truck driving jobs to uh, uh, surgeons to stock pickers, I mean, it's, it's affecting everyone. When you put all those issues together, we are at a, uh, I think a very important fork in the road. And what we do now, how we navigate the road ahead, the challenging and opportunistic road ahead is going to determine the fate of humanity. And my third issue we just covered, which is why we need a third party and uh, those are, I think, the three issues I'm inviting you to participate in a conversation, a dialogue, you know, around what is the right solution. Because I want, we, I, our objective in this process is to engage with all of you to discuss the answers. Because I know I don't have all the answers, but I do believe that if enough of us get you know, show up, enough of us take a seat at the table, we may not get to the right answer, but we'll get to an answer. An answer that might be the best answer we can get to with the information that we have. And that, that answer will allow us to take a step forward. And we're gonna learn from that step. Maybe that it was the wrong step, maybe that it was a step in the right direction. And from there, we will continue to iterate, you know, the world doesn't really just run solely on silver bullets. I do think that we can make some big moves that will make big, radical, positive change in the world rapidly. Um, but I want us to do this together because I think that we're leaving the broadcast era where the government and the media talks down to us and tells us what to do, maybe even what to think. I believe we are entering the collaborative era and so this is an, a collaborative event. This is an invitation to participate in the finding, you know, the designing of our collective future together. Yeah. Carla. I was just going to say that, um, you know, Brock and I are so in alignment with the key issues that are important for us to deal with. I'll just add two things that are also very, very critical for us. You know, um, I come from the indigenous tribes of the Cherokee. And one of the things that we've not addressed, I think appropriately in this country, is the 500 treaties that have not been met uh, for our indigenous relatives. And we've had some major victories happen in our US courts just recently with the, you know, um, the pipeline and also other major 
challenges around uh, polluting our waters. And now we can go deeper. We can start to acknowledge that, recognize it, and begin that pathway to healing. So that's gonna be a major platform that we get to talk about uh, here with our virtual town halls. Our second Absolutely. piece- Absolutely. Oh, please go ahead. No, I was just gonna say our second piece are some of the major injustices that we've seen with the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. And this is something again, that speaks to the horrendous, horrendous uh, atrocities of our past that again, we have to not, just not acknowledge because we've been acknowledging them at least via you know news headlines, but we have to actually sit down and now have some serious working groups uh, that address what are the policies we need to deploy that really help to address systemic racism. Uh, <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. It might be worth talking, mentioning since I did three, maybe you want to touch on mental health. It feels like an appropriate, you know, important. I'm issue. glad that you brought that up because I have been uh, recently uh, dealing and, you know, journeying through uh, mental health as it relates to my family and my friends and especially an issue that's near and dear to my heart uh, that our first responders are you know journeying through and our veterans and our militaries have been uh dressing for decades upon decades upon decades and we have absolutely not uh risen to the occasion i believe as a country in really acknowledging the sacrifices that they're making every single day and specifically as it relates to post-traumatic stress and so I'm excited for Brock and I to go ahead and make that a priority. Um, you know, our first responders right now, uh, not just our police officers, right, but also our doctors and nurses on the front line um, going through COVID-19, right, are literally having their, their second degree traumas happen, not just with the issues uh, with the patients, but also with what they have to now go home and deal with you know, seeing how people are dying. So I think it's exciting that we get to also acknowledge mental health um, and begin to look at what policies can we deploy effective immediately. So we'll have micro town halls that will go deeper on each of those issues. Thank you so much, Carla and Brock. I think with both of your backgrounds in social impact, community organizing, philanthropy, it's not surprising that equality and social justice, access to mental health care, and that type of community support is really something that you two are going to be concentrating on. So I, I do have one last poll, which I have at the bottom that I would love to direct everyone's attention to. So we've asked which issue that isn't often addressed by traditional politicians or party politics, which one is most important to you? And we put here some of the issues that are core to our platform here. And it actually looks like that some of our audience, the, the biggest amount of people with us today, want to hear more about the economy and the future of the US dollar, which has a lot to do with technology innovation, and especially with Brock's entrepreneurial background. Brock, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your experience on that issue and what the future might look like here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, technology has changed all of our lives. Technology has affected every business. It's affecting every system. And so I've spent over 20 years working in virtual currency and dig you know, digital currency. And one thing that most people don't realize is that game designers of virtual worlds had in some ways more freedom. Well, I mean, they definitely have more freedom, but in some ways they have more experience in yeah, economics sure. because if you're an economist in the call it analog world, you are very limited in terms of what you can do and what you can test. It's, it's so theoretical. Whereas 
in the world of virtual games, virtual worlds, you can really experiment with economic ideas and theory and implement it without the risk of harming everyone's lives. And so I had the pleasure of spending uh, a decade or so of my life in that environment. And then I spent the last decade or so of my life taking some of those ideas and attempting to bring them into the analog world in the form of digital currencies and cryptocurrencies on blockchain. And we've been able to, again, now experiment with economic theory in a way where it's not harming people's lives other than with the economic sort of speculation, but you know, that's good and bad. And I think most people understand and accept the reality of that, but the experimentation itself is very good for us. And so one of the ideas that uh, I had in 2013 that I was really interested in exploring was the idea of using this technology um, for national currency in the same way that Visa and the credit cards, you know, essentially digitize the dollar in the same way that, you know, the banking system, you know, has digitized the dollar. It's not really paper anymore. The question is, could we use these really modern technologies, you know, uh, of systems of settlement, systems of transparency, systems of efficiency, systems of mobility, right? Could we connect those to the existing monetary system? And so in 2014, uh, I had the pleasure of co-founding uh, a company called Tether, where we invented the stablecoin. We put the US dollar on the blockchain and uh, as an experiment and to show governments around the world how technology could be used to enhance their currency. And I'd say that was a successful experiment. It's doing roughly $10 trillion dollars a year of transactional volume. Like all experiments, not everything has been positive, but I'd say that's the most important data set. But what it also did is it showed governments around the world that this idea is big and it's real and it needs to be analyzed and understood. And a number of governments around the world saw this as something with potential promise and they've been working on pilot projects a number of pilot projects, you know, probably the most important of which is the uh, the Chinese government is rolling out a digital wand uh, way beyond a pilot project. And so as I'm watching all this happen, you know, I I came in and, you know, I, I, uh, I'm i an American citizen and, you know, I'm a, a patriot, but a citizen of the world. Um, you know, I went and, you know, wanted to see what's going on, you know, what sort of strategy do we have? And I think that as, a, as, as the nation that is the capital of innovation, we may, be, that we may lose that title. I think our, our, our light is diminishing in some ways, but we are still the capital of innovation. Um, I am really, really disappointed in our regulators not just doing their job of protecting people and preventing bad actors and things of that nature, but I feel like we're stifling innovation. I see some of our most talented entrepreneurs fleeing, leaving our nation to go work in Europe, Asia, elsewhere, because they don't feel safe to innovate. I think it's very important that we create an environment that fosters innovation, that creates sandboxes. We are living through the fourth industrial revolution. There will be winners and there will be losers. I hope we all win together, but I think it's very important that America is a beneficiary of the fourth industrial revolution and the way that technology is changing our world. I mean, take a look at what's happening in California today. The Uber CEO announced that they may be shutting down in the state of California because of policy, forcing them to turn every Uber driver into an employee. I understand the debate of you know people getting what they need in the struggle. I mean, it's one of the issues I raised, but at the same time, what is effective policy? Are we trying to you know basically support the taxi cab unions again? You know, are we, are, you know, we have the old and the new, right? We have to find a way to evolve together, ideally, right? We wanna move forward together. 
You know, we don't want these sort of revolutionary events. We want peaceful evolution. And, and this positive, is where we want to hear from you. Yeah, and positive change. Right. And technology matters so much. And as I watch the, 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 the big tech leaders present themselves in Washington, D.C., and I watch our leadership struggle to ask basic questions that suggest they even understand what's happening, it causes me concern. I'm not to say, not, this is not to say that everyone in our government has to be an expert in this, but we actually need some experts in this area. Technology is changing everything. I mean, just look at how social media and our democracy has been impact, how social media has affected our democracy. And it's accelerating faster and faster. I feel our leadership and our regulators basically uh, make their decisions by using the rear view mirror and looking backwards and considering how we've got gene editing systems, we've got robotics, we've got AI, we've got, we've got, we've got, we have so many technologies that are changing the world so rapidly. I think we need leadership with foresight that actually has a vision for the road ahead that can help us drive and navigate through it, which is again, one of the reasons why we're running for office. I'm not just a technology entrepreneur. I'm a small business builder. I've done it across many industries. I've been an investor, a mentor. I believe that innovators and dreamers and hardworking Americans built this country. And I think that we are seriously, we are facing very serious existential threats from multiple directions. It feels like the 11th hour and the fate of humanity is like gonna get decided over the course of the next decade. Um, I believe that we can do this. I believe that I believe that no matter what the challenge we wanna get into, if we wanna talk about environmental, we wanna talk about pop, the wealth divide, we wanna talk about mental health. I do believe that innovation is the answer to every one of those problems. But technology is neither good nor bad, it's a tool. It can be, I believe it's a tool that should be here to enhance our lives. And the outcome of the impact of it will be determined by the leadership and the people that build it. So let's build a better world together. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for that. I wanna make sure that we address the second most voted up issue on our polls. And it really leads on right from technology innovation. A lot of people are scared about what the future of work looks like. And quite a lot of people have voted up poverty, inequality, and solving that with a universal earned income might have a universal basic income or the freedom to get in. I would love for you guys to briefly to touch on what you believe on this issue. And all to address you guys look at the questions at the bottom. If you want to submit a question or upvote another person's question, please do that. And we'll make sure we use the last 10 minutes to get through as many of them as possible. So a quick touch on UBI, UEI, and what that means for the future of America. Um, as I said earlier, I think I defined the problem. Again, the great wealth divide combined with, you know, unemployment, COVID, you know, businesses being impacted and then the way that technology is changing the future of work, we got a problem. It is my belief that we have one of two choices, you know, right? And then there's everything in the middle, but I'm gonna give you the two ends of the extreme. One is we end up with a violent revolution. You know, we cannot, it, 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 it's getting scary and we're seeing some of the early signs and signals of yeah. these things and it's on both sides. Um, I'm very, very concerned. Clearly that is not something any of us should want. And if we can avoid that, we should do so at all costs. I'd say that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, and I wanna be clear, I'm not a socialist, is we find a way to make sure that every American has their at least basic needs met. You know, that no American is starving to death. That every American at least has some form of shelter right? Some sort of roof over their head and access to some form of health care. If we don't figure out how to do that, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but, you know, give people the basic needs met. If we don't figure out a way to do that. It's when you push back someone into a wall, there you go. 
to the point of absolute desperation. You know, people do wild things that no one really wants to do, but they do things because they feel they have to. And we are creating an environment that is very dangerous. And so I believe we have to have a, I don't like the term universal basic income, it feels to me like a, a handout. I prefer the term universal earned income. It's semantics, but it's the idea of a hand up, right? And, 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 and giving you the ability to, to take care of yourself. And as an American, because you're an adult and an American, you are receiving something for being a participant in the system. And we have some interesting ideas of how to pay for that. One, and I'm not saying this is it, I, this is an invitation and something to think about is, is social security working? You know, is that something that could be restructured and, you know, and then uh, taken care of in a different fashion? This is not to take away from those people that have, you know, are on social security. Uh, I am, this is not a threat. No, this no, is no. an invitation to participate in a conversation. But I look at things like unemployment. I'm a, a system, I'm a game designer of sorts, right? I'm, a, I'm a, a system designer. And so one of the most important things you learn when you are a builder of systems is the concept of incentivization. And you wanna create incentivized systems that align everyone's interests. You know, when we have aligned interests, things tend to go really well. When our interests become misaligned, things go bad. And so unemployment to me, looks like a system that has a perverse incentive. It's flawed. The idea that you receive money if you're not working, and if you go to work, you lose that. That you don't, you know, it's like, I have to give up this if I wanna do that. And it, feel, it discourages people from working. I think that's one where it might be a good idea just to get rid of unemployment altogether and let's just make sure that everybody's basic needs are met because then what happens, you have an incentive. Your basic needs are met, and I mean basic, life, liberty, and the right to the pursuit of happiness. It's up to you then from there to give yourself the best, to take level. it to the next level. There's still an incentivization for everyone to work, but you don't lose something by working. You only gain something by working. And if you wanna join the gig economy, and you know, you can do that. And this is, by the way, if we do this well, like I get up every day and I live, I live, I enjoy working. I live to serve. It, it's, it's my purpose, right? I found my life's purpose and it brings me joy and passion. A lot of people work to live, to survive, doing things they really don't like. And so one of the great examples of why we shouldn't fear technology, if we use it correctly, is technology can replace those jobs that no one, that, that, that people don't want to do. And I think that, and not in a bad way, but in a positive way. And what happens if we can figure out how to meet everyone's basic needs, right? And stop people from doing things they don't want to do, give them the room, the, 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 the space to breathe and to think and to choose what they want to do I think people will start to like do something they enjoy, something they're passionate about. I think if we navigate this correctly, America could find itself in a state of renaissance. Like Absolutely. this could be the digital renaissance that like where we, 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 in the year 2030, like we are living in a beautiful transformed world of abundance. Right. Like I believe this is possible. I believe right. if we do this right, it is possible. And so again, this is an invitation, how we pay for it. There's a lot of other welfare systems, administrative jobs, these things add up. What are the right numbers? Um, uh, potential inflation. There's some cool white papers that I'm gonna be sharing. Uh, Dan Larimer uh, has a really interesting uh, concept. And so I look forward to the conversation of yeah. how do we do this uh, in a way that uh, uh, produces the ideal results so that we can all find a path forward in peace and harmony uh, and, and future renaissance and abundance. Brittany, I'm going to add just four minutes so we can go to you questions. One of the things that I think is so crucial that Brock and I have been talking about is this idea or concept about shared humanity. And that is key 
we live in a society now that does have a lot of excess. So when you think about universal earned income, and we're going to spend a micro session just talking about that concept even more, we have to understand that you can go into a restaurant, there's food left over. You can go into a store and we have an excess abundance of items that we're, you know, we're, we're uh, selling. So what do we do with that waste in some cases, right? So there's some innovative concepts that we're going to be looking to bring forth and peeling back and, and seeing where that goes. But when I talked to friends of mine that received that $1,200 check, it was like, yes, this is all we've been waiting for. Just having an opportunity to breathe a little bit instead of realizing that I can't pay for groceries. Are you kidding me? Right? So this is an opportunity for us to be open to some new concepts that we haven't addressed before, but this is a good, good time for us to start to share these innovative opportunities to see where we can take our country. And in case we have any of uh, uh, my, my staunch libertarian friends present, uh, one thing I'm gonna point out, the idea of universal basic income was proposed by Milton Friedman. Uh, as, as, as someone that just loves to get into history, uh, and so I think between figuring out how to use technology, shared systems, create more efficiency, I believe we have enough. And if we can figure out how to do things a little bit differently, right. you know, what served us in the past is not going to serve us in the future. We can do this. I guess let's get to questions. Exactly. It was the late, great Dr. Stephen Hawking who said that technology would enable all of us one day to live in luxurious leisure. So when we're talking about equality and prosperity, Technology innovation is a core component of that. So I'm so glad that you guys are addressing that in all of your platform policies. So uh, I want to start getting to some of the questions that all of you guys have submitted. We'll start with the ones that have been upvoted the most. So this is an interesting one. Have you been in contact with Ron Paul about your presidential run? I'll say something really quick, which is that I'm sure you guys have heard us talking about obstacles that third parties and independents have. So one of our exciting new initiatives is that we're going to be organizing third party and independent candidate debates. And we're gonna get into issues that you probably never see discussed on the main state stage between the Democrats and the Republicans. We can't wait for you guys to join us on that. Maybe you guys would like to address a little bit more about our relationships with other parties that call specifically. So, um, I I'm, and I'm pretty sure Carla can say it as well. We're prepared to date, debate any candidate, any side. And if we can't get in the debates with the, uh, 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 the, called the two major parties, I hope the rest of us can have debates that are, you know, elevated. Like we don't right. need to like, let, let's demonstrate that the, the third party candidates actually have demonstrate different. leadership yeah in a way that perhaps is not always shown in our primaries and otherwise. But um, a question with Ron Paul. Yes, Ron Paul and I spent some time in Mexico uh, a few months back. We had dinner together. Uh, he even put on one of my um, my famous hats, which uh, uh, I will auction off for charity with those pictures at some point, because uh, between Ron Paul and I sharing that hat, uh, you know, it, reach out and let us know if you if you feel like making a donation and you want it. <laughs> Speaking of donations, uh, the next highest upvoted question is how can people get involved in health? So I'll answer that first. I, if you haven't yet, I'd love for you guys all to visit Vote. You can learn more about Dr. Carla and their history, a lot more about our policy platform, upcoming events, and of course, you can donate. Your resources are going to help drive this campaign, bring the momentum we need to really make sure that every voice is heard in this campaign cycle. We're doing voter engagement, making sure that we're educating people on how to vote absentee, if during COVID that makes you feel more comfortable, how you make sure that your vote counts, you get it in on time, and if you've never voted before, that you have those resources. So other ways to get involved and help. We are specifically open sourcing this platform, so I'll leave it to the candidates. Yeah, well, there's three three main ways to get involved. First and foremost, more important than anything else, is getting the word, yeah. the word out. 
whether that be, you know, coming to the website, rock.boat, signing up, but, you know, following us on Twitter, sharing those messages, Social Facebook, media, Instagram, huge. all these things. Yeah. When you, now that you know our strategy and right. if you have an opinion, when you talk to people like grassroots groundswell, yeah. they won't see us coming, right? Well, whole call, like literally whole gatherings online you know, and begin to talk about the ways that you can participate in our campaign. Not only talk about it, but donations, all of those things assist. Yeah, so there's that volunteering, obviously your time, if you're able to get involved, uh, please do that on the site. And, and donation, even, even if it's just a dollar or five dollars, it's not about the amount of money that you've given, it's about the idea that you that you are you you are in it. You've committed. You are you've you you are financially in this, right? You have bought your seat at the table, and whether you've given us one dollar or twenty eight hundred dollars, to me, it's all the same. You are uh, uh, you you have broken out your wallet, voted with your wallet. It is. I mean, it's a dollar. That's all it is. Um, you know, because what's important to me, and I'm obviously funding uh, a, a fair amount of this campaign. Um, it's uh, it's knowing that we're in this together. Thank you so much for that, Brock. So I'm gonna take one more question because we're just about out of time. And I firstly want to thank all of you for all the questions you submitted. If we don't have time to get to your question today, we will write to you directly and make sure that your question is answered by the candidates. So one last question, which I, I think is something that plays to your expertise, Brock. How do you feel about voting integrity and mail-in ballots? And what are your thoughts about using blockchain tech for voting next time around? Perfect closing question, um, <laughs> and, and I should have already said it because it is timely, right? This one's on point right now. Uh, there's a lot of questions being raised about voter integrity. I do not have the data, so I can't speak as an authority. Clearly, there is voter fraud occurs to some degree, but I have not seen any data that suggests that this is a major problem, though blockchain can solve that with blockchain digital identity, we can ensure that there's no voter fraud basically at all. I, it, it, it's absolutely something we can do, but I think the bigger benefit, which people are not talking about of why this should happen sooner rather than later, is it would allow us to do digital voting. Yeah. You know, digital voting means remote voting and with minimal friction, and as we reduce the friction to voting, we are going to make it more inclusive. It's going to really encourage Generation Z and people that might not vote otherwise to get involved in the democratic process. And the more of us involved, I believe the better off we'll be. And so, uh, Brittany, I'm gonna throw it right back to you. The number one state that should be willing to like push this forward in the 2022 or 2024 election should be the state of Wyoming. What is your prediction? When <laughs> will we, because this is a state level, by the way, this is the, the, the states choose these things. And so in the midterm elections and the 2024 presidential election, what are the odds that we'll have blockchain voting in the state of Wyoming? Because they're leading the nation right now. If they sign up to do this, we can see this in a number of nations, you know, soon. Brittany? Absolutely. So we've had five states that have already done pilot projects on blockchain voting, especially for veterans and Americans that live abroad. So we've shown some significant results and we're testing different platforms, but I'm pretty confident that we can get up to half the state in the country testing out some kind of blockchain voting by the midterm in 2022. That's my prediction, it's my hope. And I think a lot of the entrepreneurs, technologists and visionaries that are working happen do it so with that i'm going to close our first national virtual town hall i want to thank the hundreds of people who have been talking to you now on these live streams and on platforms that are watching live right now thank you for being a part of this movement and please remember to check out Black that vote sign up as a supporter so you can get involved in our mailing list and check out what our candidates are going to be up to on the campaign trail volunteer if you have skills your time that you'd like to donate and of course donate your finances if you are to give 
and a dollar is such a difference. And we can't wait to have you be part of this. Thanks again, everyone. And as I said, if you didn't get any questions, we'll make sure that Carla and Jack are able to answer those for you. And we look forward to seeing everyone next week at this time for our next virtual call. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Guys. you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brittany. Yes, thank you, Brittany. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.